All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so um, Tom's uh, put together a series on unity that we're doing for men in the morning uh, throughout the month of October. So he asked me to do the, the one on uh, segment on the unity in the family. So I got my family here to help support me. So um, let's have a prayer and then we'll get started. God, we come before you just grateful for just your love and your faithfulness and just the way you do everything possible to create unity among your people and how, um, how we have just you to imitate to really build unity in our families. I pray that you really bless our time today together and uh, may we be encouraged and uh, help each other to grow our families, to be more united, to glorify you in greater ways, God. I'm so grateful for my family and how you bless me and uh, pray that uh, I'm so grateful they're here with me and pray you'll bless our time together today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about unity in the family. Um, I want to start with this slide. It says, it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Um, and I think, obviously, that's very true, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, we're all different. Everybody's different. Even if they look very similar, everybody's different. Even twins are different, right, in a lot of ways. Uh, this is... La Familia. So um, this is actually a recent trip that we all took to go visit Cameron and Gretchen, who are on the far right there. And um, so we went down to Atlanta to visit them and spend a weekend with them. I did not get the ladies' permission to show the slide, so I won't stay on here very long. <laughs> but um, uh, we call it La Familia because um, when we were in Mexico, we took our family to Mexico, kind of one last trip before they all started getting married. It was just Rhonda and our three kids. At that time, we only had three kids. And uh, so we went there, and we all stuck together the whole time at this resort. So we found out later we were called La Familia by everybody. Oh, you're La Familia. So they kind of <laughs> tagged us that name because we were always together. So we, we liked it, and it stuck, and it's kind of grown. And, and now we actually have true uh, Hispanic, full Hispanic blood in our La Familia. So it's even more legit now, right, with Karina. So... Um, so I want to do some other background stuff first before we get into focusing on the family. So I took this information from uh, Steve Staten's uh, report that he did for our church here at Indy. And uh, there's three main words for Greek words for unity. And you'll see why I'm, I'm going to this now. And I wanted to kind of bring this out of his paper. The first one is henotes, which is unity, spelled wrong there, unity, unity, <laughs> unity. Uh, it's doctrinal unity. Um, and it means that we agree and we uh, align absolutely. And this is more for like doctrinal truths that there's no question. You know, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So that's perfect unity. We align completely. But that's not what unity always looks like. Okay. The second word for unity is uh, the word hen, which means one. And it refers to relational or uh, it looks like familia, right? But familia. <laughs> Families type oneness, okay? So it's that expressing an idea of togetherness, relational connection, okay? That's when you see the word, this Greek word throughout the Bible, that's what he's talking about. It's just a feeling of togetherness, oneness, relational. And that's the one we're going to focus on the most for the family. But then there's another two words that are very similar um, that are used kind of interchangeably. I won't even pronounce them for you. You can read them there. But they basically mean harmony. Harmon harmonia, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Moving in unison, rushing along and in unison together is what the second word really means. And basically this is about having unity such that you can progress and move and make things happen. Okay, And this is all throughout the book of Acts, right? Because you see Acts, is the church is moving. And because they have this sense of unity and oneness, hi guys, they're able to move together because of that oneness. So all of these are, are different flavors or different, you know, expressions of unity. Just like we understand there's different types of love, right? There's the, there's the agape love, the, the phileo love, which is friendship, the eros, which is romantic. They all mean love, but they're different fashions of it, right, that, that have different purposes. And so when we talk about unity, it's important we understand there's all types of unity in a sense and that we've got to make sure how, what kind of unity we're really talking about. And for the family, we're especially talking about that, that middle one. And I'm going to talk about why, okay? So let's back up and just say why unity first of all. Okay, when you look at the scriptures, why do we need to be unified? Why is that important? Okay, 
First scripture, John 17, 22 through 23, where Jesus is speaking, he says, I've given them, I think this is his prayer actually, right? He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you've sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. So the whole idea of unity here is that we are able to glorify God, okay? That we're able to see God because of our unity. Other people can see God. To glorify God. Second point, John 13, 35. This is love. This, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The fact that we're loving each other, we're unified, that speaks to the truth. What is the truth? Who are the people that have the truth? You know, what do I need to look to? What do I need to be like? Who are the disciples? It's the ones that love each other, that are unified. So we have unity because it really helps to show what the truth is. And then we need unity if we're going to succeed or stand. You know, Jesus said that uh, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided itself will fall. So if we're not unified, we're not going to succeed. Okay, we're going to fail miserably if we're not unified. I mean, I even think about how God caused the people to fail who were trying to build the tower that would reach up to the heavens. They wanted to reach God, so they're building this tower. So what did God do? He just gave them different languages, which we weren't able to be unified because they couldn't communicate. And what happened? The thing failed and it just quit, right? So um, we need unity in order to succeed. But ultimately, why do we need unity? What's the ultimate purpose? If you take all that together, what's the ultimate purpose? Look at the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4. The ultimate reason for unity is to accomplish the work. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge in the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the whole, I, this word work, we read this last week when Tom did the class, and it just jumped out at me. It's like, wow, that's really the whole crust of it all, is we're unified, we're able to work, we're able to succeed, we're able to move on and and but but then I asked the question what's the work so we talked about already well first let's look at some some other quotes here so Mother Teresa says I can do things you cannot do and you can do things I cannot together we can do great things again that's that concept that if you have unity then you have different parts with different talents different abilities working together then the work can really get done we're not a team because we work together. We're a team because we respect, trust, and care for each other. So this is like, okay, we just can't go do the work. We have to build a team, build unity. That allows us to do the work. We're not a team that's successful and unified just because we go work. We have to make sure that we have unity. And if we have unity, then we'll have a team. We'll have a team that gets the work done. But what is the work of the organization? It depends on what the organization is. The church we've just talked about, right? And if we boil down the work of the church is to glorify God, leading everyone to Him, right? I mean, if you look at the things Jesus said that we looked at, it all comes down to that. We're here as a church to glorify God and to lead people to Him forever, okay? But what are some other organizations whose work is a little different? Name some other organizations and what's their purpose, their work. A company. What's a company's goal? What's their, what's their bottom line? Make, money. Be a, make a profit. Unless they're a nonprofit, then their goal is whatever their ambition is to be a nonprofit. Exactly. A company is to make profit. What about a sports team? I showed you the answer too quick. The sports team is to, to win. You know, I like, uh, who is it? Tony, not Dungy, but uh, the other guy that's on the talk radio all the time. Um, one of the other coaches used to be at New York. I'm blanking out on his name, but he would always say, you play to win the game. Herman, right? Oh, yeah. 
You know, you play to win the game, and really you play to win the championship. That's what teams really do, right? They're leaving up games so they can win the championship. That's why that team exists, the sports team. Why do you run the race? To win. Well, unless you're me, you don't run to win. You run to be in shape. But then you have, um, uh, what about an army? An army is there to win the war. Not even the battle, but to win the war, right? So here's the thing. Whatever the organization is, that's going to affect how that unity looks, what that unity looks like somewhat. Now, unity is still unity, right? But it's going to look a little different depending on what the goal of that organization is. What's the work of that organization? And how do I get to unify? That's going to look a little different. If I'm in a company and I've got to have a profit, then I may need to cut headcount. I'm probably not going to do that in a church. We don't cut headcount in the church, right? You know? Um, if you're a coach, man, you're going to drive. You're going to pick the best players. If I'm talking about my family, I don't pick players that are the best. I mean, that's my family. That's, that's a different organization. There's a different work involved there. So that unity looks different. How we motivate, how we inspire, what do we, what do we scheme about? That's going to be different depending on what that organization is and what's the work of that organization. All right, all that's probably, yeah, we knew that. So let's get moving here. So what about the family? What's the work of the family? Why, why as a family do we need to be united? What is the work of the family? What's the purpose of the family? To love one another, help each other. Okay, to love one another. And that's to love one another, to help each other, to help each other grow. And that's similar to all the other, but it's a little different, right? It has some different things around it. And I look at it this way. To love its members by meeting their needs. That's the bottom purpose of the family. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you see this. Uh, the bottom one, I think it's kind of chopped off. It's the physical needs, right? It's food, water, and then safety is like security and shelter. And those are fundamental. We know that. We do that. In all honesty, you can eat in most cultures, most countries, you can get that even outside of your family, right? There are mechanisms to give you that. But even those mechanisms fail at that middle, most essential piece, right? I mean, basically, the bottom two are just to exist and not die coming out of the womb, Right? But the middle one, that's what starts to build and, and make a person have an identity and make a person whole, is that they need to feel a sense of belonging, they need to feel love, they need to have intimate relationships. Guys, there's no other organization that, literally there's no other organization that meets that like the family is intended to meet that. And that's our problem, right? In society, we all know that. The breakdown of the family is why we don't have these people having these essential needs met of a sense of belonging and love. You can take a child who's been in an orphanage, had their physical needs met, they were safe, they had the bottom two covered, but that middle one right there didn't happen. And there's all kinds of dysfunction in their life for many, many, many years because of that. So that's not a slam on them as a person. That's because they didn't get that fundamental need met. But here's the challenge. Are our families unified so that we're meeting, really meeting that need in a growing way? Right? And we can't assume that just because we're in the church that we're having, we're meeting that need the way we need to meet it. And we can't give ourselves to any organization, be it our job, our sports, or our church, to the point that we don't meet that essential need of the family. Okay? So that's what we're really focusing on is how do we build unity in the family? We, why do we build unity in the family? So the family can do what it's meant to do, which is to show that sense and give that sense of belonging and love to every member of that family. Make sense? Yeah. Now, here's the key point. A family doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be united. If it's united, it's going to meet that need. It doesn't have to be perfect. Not every duck's in a row, not everybody does things the same way, not everybody does the right thing, but if we're united, we'll meet that essential need, which will allow every individual to go on and do other things in their life. So our focus today is how? How do we build unity in the family? Okay? And here's where we want to kind of discuss and have more time together. I have three main points that I want to kind of camp out on today. And um, the first is that... You can't even think about having a family that's united until you're really united in your marriage, okay? Now, I know there are blended families, mixed families, different families. You've got single moms, single dads. That happens, and that's different, right? Because if you don't have a marriage at the top to look to, then 
you can't, the kids can't expect that marriage to be united. Now, obviously it has other challenges that we could talk about in another class, but when there's a marriage at the top of that family, that, that marriage has to be united or you won't have unity in the family. If you don't have unity in the family, you're not going to meet those basic fundamental needs of people feeling loved and belong to. So let's talk about the unity in the family. First of all, children will reflect your marriage. If you're combative, blame shifting, disrespectful, ungrateful, impatient, rude, selfish, the children will reflect that. They will just imitate that. That just becomes who they are because that's what they feel. That's what they sense. I mean, you, that's one thing. You can't hide who you really are from your family. You may hide it at work. You may fake it at church. You may fake it at, you know, whatever other team you're on, but you can't fake it in the family. That's just where you live. That's day in and day out. So where our marriage is, that's going to really, that will impact our kids. That's going to be what they imitate. Or are we humble and gracious, respectful, grateful, patient, kind, and giving? I mean, that's what we want our kids to be, but they're going to, they're going to imitate what they see in us, in our unity. So we've got to make sure that we're fighting for unity in our marriage. We're not perfect. We blow it in our marriage. Um, my wife and I have known each other since seventh grade. We started dating our senior year of high school. We basically have grown up together, we went to college together, we became Christians together we, before we were married. We kind of grew up together, but we still blow it, especially her. I mean, no, we, <laughs> especially me. I mean, we, we blow it. But one thing we try to do is we let our kids know when we've blown it, and we try to apologize to them about how we've set the wrong example, how dad was too harsh, dad was too impatient. Mom wasn't respectful in this situation. And just be open and vulnerable with our kids. Again, that's dealing with unity, not just with her and I, but how it affects the whole family. Um, talk consistently with your spouse about the kids and their needs and be on the same page slash get on the same page. You're not going to be on the same page. My wife and I think very differently. The families we grew up in are very, very totally different from each other. Hers is very open, very out there. You say what you feel. You, you are who you are. You're very transparent. It's blunt. It can be rude. It's just raw. My family is the leave it to beaver family. Everything's perfect, quiet. You don't say anything. You don't disagree about anything. You know, it has harmony, but it's kind of shallow sometimes, and it's not, you know, deep by nature. It's gotten a lot deeper. It's gotten a lot better over the years, but we tended to kind of, not talk about things when we disagreed. I didn't really see how to resolve conflict um, and how to resolve an argument and disagree and resolve that. She saw that played out. So we, we come at those things very differently. So we have to really be able to learn to listen to each other and get on the same page with how we're going to build this family and what our family is going to look like. And with that, also just planning and praying continuously together in your marriage for your family. I mean, it's like it's a constant conversation when they were little to, to even now when they're all married and living outside of our home. How can we plan? What are we praying about for our kids? What do we think they need? What, where do we think they are? How can we help them? How can we get more time together? Just constantly thinking, planning, scheming, praying constantly together about our family. So if you're married and you have a family, you have to really keep fighting for the unity in your marriage in order to have that unity in your family. Any other comments about the marriage and how you see the marriage affecting your families. Maybe this is jog some more thoughts. Okay. So that's the first main point. I just feel like you can't go past that one, right? Now, you've got to do other things, but I'm just saying start there. The unity of the family. The second topic I want to talk about it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Of course, you know the scriptures say, children, respect your parents, right? And we know the scripture says, wives, respect your husbands. And in 1 Peter, he also says, husbands, respect your wives. Here he says, show proper respect for everyone. Everyone needs to feel respected. And to build unity in the family, all parts need to feel respected. This requires for us to be gracious. 
Why? Why, why does it take grace in order to show proper respect, in order to be respectful? We're not always doing respectful things or being respectful. Right. Okay. And where does that sometimes come from? It's easy when you're being critical to not want to respect someone. It's like, oh, well, why would I do this if they're doing this? Right. Okay. So we, we get critical about things they're not doing well, so therefore, you know, we don't tend not to respect them because we see the bad. And I, I th for me, that's kind of the bottom line, right? I mean, you... It's so easy to see the wrong, right? I mean, by nature, I don't know why we're that way, but maybe some people are much more gifted. I think about Lisa Cage. She's much more gifted to see the good in everybody. But most of us, I mean, you see the bad. It just kind of like, it just glares at you. And if you focus on that and that's what you look at, it's really hard to respect the good that you see. And that's why you have to be gracious because you're going to see flaws. We're not perfect. We're, we have problems. All of us do. So if I'm not gracious about the problems that I see, forgiving, setting those aside, then I'm not able to see the amazing things that are there that are fully worthy of respect that I can not just respect because I have to, but I really admire and truly respect from my heart because I'm not focused on the negative. I'm focused on what is awesome about this person. And it's coming from my heart to show them respect for that. But if I'm not gracious, I'll never get there. I won't see that. I'll be clouded by what I see as all the weaknesses, which we all have them, right? But then why? why? Why is showing respect going to build unity? How does show, showing respect build unity in, this, in the family? Okay. Exactly. When you feel respected, you feel valued. You feel like you bring something to the table. That makes you want to come to the table because you feel worthy. You feel like I've got something to be and to contribute here. Exactly. So we feel valued when we feel respected. Therefore, we contribute more. What else? When, when you feel respected, then the temptation to be defensive drops. Okay. And when that happens, then you begin to relax more and you're more open to actually other ideas and even being corrected. Yeah. You're much more open to being corrected. Uh, that's true. If you're wrong. That's exactly right. I'm going to share more about that later. But when you feel respected, then you're more teachable. And think about that. You've got a family. You're trying to teach these kids things. If they feel respected, they're going to be much more open to being taught things because they don't feel beaten down by what you're trying to teach them. They feel lifted up about other areas you respect them in. It makes them much more open to learning other things. Okay? Why else? What are the thoughts about why respect builds unity? Or some good thoughts. Let's discuss what makes people feel respected. You could think beyond family, but obviously we're talking about family. But what, what is it that makes people feel respected? How can you make people feel respected? It says show proper respect. How do we show proper respect? What, what are ways we can do that? What are ways that communicates respect? Just asking, uh, asking opinions. Okay. Uh, Maybe maybe my kids know something more than more than I do. We can you know seek their uh, opinion exactly. on uh, on uh, what that is. Yeah, don't you feel respected when someone asks you your opinion, especially when they go so far to say, "I need to learn this from you. I see this in you. What do you think about this?" Yeah, you feel respected when you're asked your opinion, you're asked questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think when you're listened to. Yeah. Okay. When I'm listened to. Yeah. When you're really heard, you're listened to, you're, you're allowed to express yourself versus being cut off and corrected before you can finish what you're saying, okay? What else makes you feel respected? <coughs> I put down some things that I think, um, especially ways in which we can show our kids respect, and some of these you've said, but we need to seek input from our kids. Um, what do you see in me? What do you see in our family? You know, what do you think about this or that situation? We need to build up our kids in areas where they excel. Let them know that you can learn from them. You know, there's areas in my kid's life that I just say, you're, you're better than me at this. I, I admire you. I watch you. I say that to, to all my kids in areas that they are gifted in and things that they do well. They're just better with people. They're just better at being um, loving and connecting and communicating. My daughter's always initiating. She's always giving to people that she 
maybe it's not out of sight, out of mind. I'm an out of sight, out of mind guy. She's like, has all these relationships that she keeps going no matter where in the world they live. And she keeps thinking of people all the time. Um, I think about Tyler, just his gentleness and patient work with patience. I get with people at work and try to show them how to do something with the computer. If they don't get it right away, I'm frustrated. I'm ready to move on. He's working with these patients that trying to help them in their health and they're, they don't even want it, but he's there for 45 minutes giving to them, connecting with them, and they just fall in love with him. And then Cameron, I think about how he's just, he can talk to the, a stranger and talk about anything and just big, get a conversation going and keep it going and just, just connect with people and find connections. Like, how do you do that? I just I can't do that. And I just like to watch my kids do these things and just imitate them and let them know these are areas that they are better than me at, that I, I imitate them and I look at them. Um, allow them to be different and not feel threatened by that. When our kids went away to college, let's see, uh, Tyler was in South Carolina, Jacqueline was in Chicago, Cameron was getting ready or had already gone to, I guess he went after uh, Jacqueline moved to IU, he went to IU. But we had a family devotional when we all came together for Christmas break, and I realized there were some differing opinions that were starting to form in our kids' minds about life, about ministry, about different things. And they were getting, um, feeling strongly about these convictions and these ideas that weren't exactly our ideas and our convictions the same. And so we had a really good family discussion. I said, guys, it's, it's amazing. It's great to see how you're developing your own thinking. That's part of why you go away, so you can figure out who you are, what you really believe, and how you, how you really, you know, what, what are your values and what are your convictions. That's awesome. But as we're different, we had this whole talk, remember this, guys, that we still got to be unified. So we got to respect each other. We got to realize that, okay, those are your convictions. That's awesome. Don't think less of me because my convictions are different. And I'm not thinking less of you because your convictions are different. Let's work together. We're not going to agree on everything, but let's stay unified. Let's stay respectful of each other, even though we think a little differently. So allowing the difference, but bringing that back to unity, don't let those differences take you apart and divide and disrespect one another. We already talked about apologizing to them when you blow it. Um, be open with them about your weaknesses and be real. You know, like I said, here's your strengths, but also here's my weakness. Here's something I don't do well. And, and have them pray for you about that. Be real. These are all ways that we've put into practice trying to be respectful to our kids and built this, as they've gotten older, this more adult-to-adult -adult relationship that really fosters the unity. <clears throat> Well, let's talk about this. How can your kids feel disrespected by you? Now, I know we have in this room, even my own, but kids. And I'm going to talk about this in a second. We're all kids to somebody, right? We have parents, too. So when we talk about family, I'm even thinking not just our immediate family, but my parents and my brothers and sisters and my wife's parents and their brothers and sisters, her brothers and sisters. So, you know, when you think about this, think about more than just parents to kids, I guess that's how I kind of wrote this, but how, how can we, um, how can our kids or other people feel disrespected by us? What are things that we do? How do we act? I think for me, I think um, I always struggle with overreacting. Okay. And so um, what I realized is when I would overreact, I would shut them down mm. and wouldn't even give them a chance to um, really share what they felt because I had already made a judgment in my mind that I knew what I was what they were thinking and I knew what they needed to do and you know when really that even none of that really mattered it was more of what they were feeling <coughs> at the time and listening mm. and, and not being so quick to just jump to a conclusion yeah yeah so um something that, uh, pardon me, something that was touched on earlier it's just being just being listened to okay right just just having that somebody's just the just be able to step back and just to be listened to. Yeah, exactly. It's so another way of, of loving somebody. Exactly, exactly. And, and like one is saying here, when we when we react because we heard something that kind of alarms us, maybe creates some fear, then we quickly respond to that and we kind of shut down them from speaking and we're not listening. And maybe even our advice is eventually right and needs to be heard. But we've got to give them time to talk or they don't feel respected. We've got to listen to them. I think Tyler shared that earlier. So not, not shutting them down, not reacting when they share something that's different. But that is, that's hard, isn't it? Because don't you feel like, a, like the hairs in the back of your head pop up sometimes, right? Somebody says something that 
I've always taught you otherwise. Or I've said that for years, and now you're just now saying, you know, <laughs> you heard it from so and so, you know. And it's like, whoa, don't react, but just listen and let them talk. That's, that's a great point. That's a big challenge. How else can our kids? Yeah. Yeah. Something else is is recognizing your position in your children's eyes. Mm. Okay. Uh, even though it may not even be my opinion, mm. I've had to learn to to actually ask first, "What do you think?" Okay. Because uh, uh, you got to remember, it's kind of like remembering who your audience is mm -hmm. and what uh, that dynamic is. Right. Because right. that really sets a tone for the beginning of every conversation. Yeah. You can uh, set a tone. Sure, that's a great point. L let me see if I capture what you're saying. As a parent, you tend to be the authority figure, so you got to be careful when you speak. You're bringing that authority to the conversation by default, by default and you got to recognize that, and you got to be able to address that, so you're not shutting them down by this authoritative role that you have and that way you have of coming across. That's a great point, and that's just thinking about wow, I've got to, I've got to overcome what obstacle might be there by virtue of who I am and what my position is, right? Yeah, I think going along with that, I think I've had to learn that, you know, as they grow to different stages, they're, they're becoming men and women. And so I really, I remember how difficult it was when the boys were becoming men and mm -hmm. I was the woman. And there was a dynamic there that clashed. It didn't go well for a while. And so I think that I had to really learn you know, to communicate with them in a different way and treat them with respect because they're a man. Yeah. And that was hard because I'm the mom, I'm the authority, but, mm -hmm. but I, I remember that being a huge, you know, shift in my thinking that if I don't get this, then I'm going to lose my voice. I mean, yeah. I mean, emotionally, I felt like I was going to lose some connection if I didn't do that. Right, right. Being able to shift as that relationship grows, <laughs> as th their age changes, how do we shift that relationship and make sure that we... We give them their need to feel respected as, as an adult, as a man, uh, when it comes to the boys. Good. How else can we make people feel disrespected? Kids, how do we make you feel disrespected? Yeah. I think sometimes just as easy as not giving them time. Okay. I mean, mm. at least for me growing up, uh. I always felt like my parents were just always busy and kind of doing their own thing or, you know, that kind of stuff. So just not even just having, like not feeling, you know, just having that time with them. Mm. Not giving them time. Boy, that's, that's so insightful. You know, we don't think of that as disrespect, do we? But, but um, when we're not really taking the time and giving the time, giving the attention, the quality time, not just the leftover time, um, they'll feel disrespected if they get the leftovers. I know my wife feels disrespected if she gets leftovers, right? So how much more, and the kids are going to feel that. They're going to sense that you're just giving them the leftovers, if anything. So giving them that time, that quality time, planning it, that's a great point, or, or they'll feel disrespected, okay? You know, something I experienced growing up, too, is, is the inability of a parent to connect emotionally. Mm. Okay. say when you're younger <laughs> when you're older too there's there's a lot of turmoil yeah internally yeah and you have to be taught many times and how to how to think about it how to deal with it, how to express it yeah and as parents we need to, to lead our children right that. right and i remember a lot of frustration growing up because you just didn't know how to even yeah capsulize what i was saying yeah how to how to communicate what we're really thinking how to connect with them emotionally and, and a lot of us, you know, um, maybe we didn't have that so much in, in our family dynamic. And it's definitely um, kind of more historic. You know, you see less of that in older, more traditional families. But even, you know, even in our lives, we can just be shut down and not learn how to connect with each other. And I think, you know, the whole series we've had on, on, um, on the marriage and uh, I choose us and even the parenting stuff, a lot of it comes down, what, what I see is vulnerability. How do I learn to be vulnerable, really humble and vulnerable? And I think sometimes we've seen vulnerability as a sign of weakness. And as a parent, we can fear sometimes vulnerability because then we think, oh, we're not you know, um, being in control and in charge. But obviously there's a wrong way to do it, right? We don't want to totally just dump everything on our kids and expect them to fix us. But a, a vulnerability is a really way of connecting, right? It gets past some things that maybe um, we wouldn't have otherwise said. <clears throat> I know I kind of went on to something else there. 
Um, I want to talk about another angle on this, and that is um, expressing, because it said show proper respect to everyone. Um, I want to share for a minute about just really how much we need to express our appreciation to our parents and, and even seek advice from them no matter where they are spiritually. And I wouldn't limit it just to parents. Let's talk about your siblings, um, your parents, your aunts, your uncles, your, your family members, okay, that go beyond maybe your immediate household. And uh, for me, what I, I had a really good conversation with my parents um, last weekend or two weekends ago when I went to visit with them when Ron was at the, the marriage, uh, the women's day. And I had a good conversation with them about me teaching this class. And, and I was reflecting back on, on my life. And I said, you know, I really made some mistakes when I was young and I studied the Bible <laughs> and, and I became a Christian. I really felt like all the answers I needed were going to come from um, the Bible and from the people around me who were teaching me the Bible. And I really didn't feel the need to come back to you, mom and dad, for input and advice and guidance. And I said, that was really wrong. That was really disrespectful, and I'm sure that really hurt you. And I said, you know, um, I'm really ashamed to say that not until I had teenagers did I start realizing this. Because when I started having teenagers, I thought I had all the answers in life, you know. And then when I had teenagers, I thought, wow, this is really a challenging stage. And then I started thinking about my parents raising five teens without the support of a church family like I have without the scriptures, and yet they did a phenomenal job of raising teenagers and training us in so many aspects of life. And I just, I was blown away, and I just thought, wow, I need, I, I have so much more respect for my parents. And I remember especially trying to show that to them and communicate that to them and start going to them for advice and for input. And honestly, during all those years, there was probably about, um, I don't know, probably a good 20 years of that before I really had kids that were teenagers from the time I became a Christian. And all during that time, I wanted to teach my family what I learned. I wanted to share them the scriptures. I wanted to, and I had attempts to do that. But it really wasn't until I started really respecting them and showing them proper respect that I was able to go some places and have some heart-changing talks with them about what I had learned in the scriptures. And um, it just totally changed the dynamic of our relationship. Now, they sensed it, but I really sensed it. I really felt that I couldn't go certain places because I knew I wasn't showing them the right kind of respect. And it, it, once I was doing that, and I need to get better at it still, but then we did. We had some very good, productive conversations to the point that we're actually able to sit down and study the Bible together. And I was able to say some things that were really hard to say, but they were the truth. But I was able to say them in love and from a position of respect, which enabled them to hear it so much better. And um, it's not an equation that necessarily works, you know, 100% for everybody, but it's part of the process. The more I can be respectful of people, somebody said it earlier, then they're more open to that correction, that input, that direction, because they feel secure in the fact that you respect them, and therefore they're open, open to, to learn from you. And this really opened up the door for my family, Ron, Ron and I, to send out my mom and dad and study the Bible, and ultimately for them to be baptized at, um, in, late in their 60s when they were baptized. Um, maybe even they were 70 at that point, yeah. So, and that, that still blows me away to this day that at that point I could teach my parents, let, they would let me teach them, and they not only that would, would come to some convictions that were different than what they had their whole life at that age, but I really do believe a lot of that was born and, and, and pr promoted from me getting in a better position of respect for them. So I say, share that story just to say, guys, we need to show proper respect to everyone. And, and your families, your extended families, your parents, your siblings, there are amazing things in their lives to respect and, and, and that you need to respect and show them that respect. And, and that's going to really open up the door for you to help them in other areas that you've been blessed in, things that you've been shown that maybe they haven't seen. So, uh, I mean, we, I'm sure you'll hear about this more in the future classes about respect because I think it's a huge piece of what really builds unity is respect. But being able to do that in our families in all directions, with each other. I know one thing Rhonda was always really good about, still good about, is really helping the kids show proper respect towards each other and resolving conflict together and having the talks they need to have together and not letting them disrespect each other. Another point I didn't put on here, but when your children are little, it's so important to teach them to be respectful. Teach them to respect you. Teach them to respect other adults. Teach them to respect 
um, each other, teach them to respect people's things, people that teach them to respect their teachers, their bosses, their coaches. And there's a whole talk we can have about how we need to train our kids to be respectful. Um, and I think if we have a deep conviction about respect, we'll teach them that same respect because there's so much that's going to come from being in a position of respect. doesn't mean that people around you are always right and you just always agree with everything, but you just, you're a much more respectful person. It's a much more productive, unifying place to be. So let's go to the last point. I want to spend a little time on this last point. Um, the third point I have is that we need to scheme for ways to draw the family together. So this story and this uh, verse in the Bible, um, I share it all the time. Most people that know me know it's my favorite verse. And I took it out of the old NIV. You know how the new NIV that you get online just is not reading the same? And there's some ways it's better, but when you've like grown to become very intimate with a verse and it's said a different way, it just doesn't work for you. So I have it in here on the slide the way it is in my old paper Bible, right? It says, like water spilled on the ground which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But God does not take away life. Instead, He devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from Him. This encapsulates the character, the heart of God. That that's who God is. I will never give up on you. I don't care what you do. I will be faithful even when you're not faithful. I, I will pursue you to the ends of the earth. I will keep scheming. I'll keep figuring out how to win you over. Now what's really cool about this, I share this verse a lot in a lot of contexts, but the context I'm sharing it now is exactly the context of this verse. If you go back and read your Bible, uh, you think you have a difficult, and this, this part is for all of us, for all families, but especially speaks to families that maybe feel like things haven't gone the way I had dreamed and hoped they would go. And to some aspects, all of our families have pieces of that, some maybe more than others, but the, you go back and look at David's family. David's son, I might pronounce the name wrong, Anon, actually there was stepbrothers and sisters, etc., Anon actually raped his sister. And Absalom knew about it and was irate. And eventually Absalom, his brother, which is also David's son, kills his brother Anon and then flees to another country and another land. So you think you have a dysfunctional family. David had a very dysfunctional family. So what happens in, in the beginning of chapter 14, Joab knows that, that David longs to be with his son Absalom, even though his son has done this, but he doesn't feel like it's the right thing to do. He can't really justify going after his son and pulling him in. So he's not doing anything, and Joab realizes this. So Joab comes up with this scheme for this woman to dress up and look all somber and go to the king and say, hey, my two sons, my five husband died, and my two sons got in this fight, and no one was there to break them up, and one killed the other one, and now everyone's trying to lynch and kill the one who killed the other one, and if that happens, I'll have no son, no, nobody to produce my father's name, blah, 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 my husband's name, and on and on. So he appeals, she, he gives her this whole story to go tell the king and dress appropriately so he'll believe it. Within the end of it, he basically, she basically says what Joab said to tell him, this is really for you. You have a son that you need to go after and bring back who's been banished from your home. And he quotes this verse to say, this is the heart of God. You need to have this heart and it's okay and it's right. Do whatever it takes. Go after your son. It's so powerful, but it's the exact context. And this is the way we've got to think about our families at every stage. We've got to keep scheming. How are we going to build togetherness? See, this is why I say the whole thing I've been talking about that unity in the family and how to get it may look a little different than the army or may look a little different from a sports team or a company. It goes beyond that. It's to meet that essential need of everybody needs to feel that they belong and they feel loved no matter what choices and what mistakes they've made. That's the family. And you, as any member of that family, whether you're the husband, the wife, the parent, the child, you've got to be thinking, how do I scheme how do I figure out how to devise ways so that those that are not where they need to be can be brought in tighter? 
It could be for whatever reason. Maybe they've completely uh, have a different way of lifestyle and belief system. Maybe they just spiritually think different. Maybe they, they just struggling in, in life with job or career or whatever. It doesn't matter, but find ways to pull people together. And that's the heart of God, right? God is like, I will put the lonely in families. God is like, I will not hold their sins against them. I mean, you go out through, all throughout the Bible, God's like, I'm not going to treat you as your sins deserve. There's grace, there's grace, there's grace, and I'm scheming to figure out how to win you over. And I will not stop. That has to be our view as a family. We have to have the heart of God if we're going to have unity in our family, regardless of what's happened. So let's talk about uh, some practical things for a little bit in, in this light. So what schemes do you think you've come up with to help pull your family together? What are some things you do, some practical things? What are some ways you've come up with to really build unity, to bring together your family? Because really, that's that, that unity core of that is that togetherness, that you know, really sense of belonging. How, do you, how, do you, how have you done that? Let's get some ideas. I think at times when the kids were in different states and they weren't with us, I think when we were together, it was just really, what can we do to make it feel special? You know, okay. We just want this to be a time they walk away thinking, wow, I love my family. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's also just having conversations about life and, you know, and not all those things you want to put under the rug, pull them out, you know, yeah. and, you know, you got to time that well, mm. <laughs> but, um, but you just, you just go after those things or those weaknesses or those areas of insecurities or whatever. And. You just keep trying to find ways to pull them up, to, mm -hmm. to pull it together. And yeah. I don't know. I just think those are the kind of things that, that we yeah. thought about a lot. That's right. And I think just even, you know, we'll, we'll have plans to do something that I think is tremendous. And on the way to do it, Rhonda will be like, well, how do we make it even better? I'm like, what? We've already done all this to make it rich. She's like, it's, it's, we gotta, how do we make it even better? How do we make it even richer? I'm like, sometimes I feel challenged because there's always this, it's so awesome. There's always this call to make it great, make it even better and scheming. She's always scheming to figure out how to take it even higher, to make it deeper, more meaningful, more memorable, more powerful. But what are some other things we've done or that you've done? I, I remember when uh, my girls were in grade school, uh -huh. I would take, actually take a, a day they would go on various field trips and what have you I would take a day a vacation day just go on a just go on a hmm. on a, uh, a one of the field trips with them okay that way they know that hey dad's interested in what's going on at school right and uh, I remember thinking about the same time that thinking them thinking about them being teenagers and me being a teenager it wasn't cool to hang around with mom and dad right you know how I, you know how can I hedge against that right uh, approaching that yeah. time yeah and that's one of the things I come up with is that's awesome spend that time with them in school right and uh that's awesome. And that's scheming, right? I mean, that's yeah. trying to figure out what can I do to overcome that barrier and like Thomas was talking about. I'm also thinking, uh, when I was 12, I started smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Well, when they were approaching middle school, somebody's going to offer you this. Mm -hmm. In, in yeah. high school, somebody's going to offer you drugs. Yeah. We would have conversations about that. Yeah. When you're at college, you're going to be tempted to go into the party lifestyle. Right. Sharing my past, right. my experiences, mm. to help them not make, same, not make the same mistakes that I did. Right. Yeah, they're going to make their own mistakes, but hopefully they'll yeah. learn something that, Amen. hey, dad, dad blew it, and here's how. Right. And, yep, that's awesome. You, you try to get them in a different, different outcome sure. than, were, than what I did. Amen. And that goes back to even being vulnerable and about your own life as well as teaching them. Yep. Rajan? One of the things that I'm actually doing and picking up is camping just because uh -huh. we live in a technology um, uh, saturated. Yeah. And I know I get distracted because if I'm home, I got this or that. I'm never home. So when I'm home, I'm going to clean or yeah. do this or that. So the last year, we've kind of embarked on this journey to, to, to camp. And yeah. Uh, you know, I bought a camper and I, you know, 
I've, I've never done anything like that in my life. I don't know the first thing about I mean, I grew up in Africa. I have no idea. I mean, we're, we're, we're yeah, Ghana, really. Some of the places that we go camping, I am completely uncomfortable with. I am typically the only African-American in any of the areas that we go to. Yeah. But really, there's a bigger reason why we're there. Mm. It's because I need to pull away from that distraction. Mm. I mean, we don't get cell phone reception in most of the camps. <laughs> So there's no cell phone, and then when the kids go to bed, you know, you get some time to connect with your spouse without all the distractions. Yeah. So that's something that I feel like we've invested quite a bit. That's day, awesome. Uh, yeah. Just because we just need to do something different. Right. And I think when you're saying that, you're becoming something that you're not to meet a need that's much bigger. And isn't that what God did? I mean, Jesus did. He became sin for us. You know, I mean, that, that's, again, that's the character in the heart of God, becoming some things that we're not, going way beyond to really do whatever <coughs> it takes to win over, to, to build unity, to build that time together. I know something Ron and I started was when uh, they were still in high school, um, it was like Christmas break, great, time together. Well, they want to spend time with their friends when it was Christmas break. So it was hard to get time together, quality time. So we created a new tradition. We're going to go to Chicago for two nights. We're going to go to the city. We're going to get a hotel. They're really cheap that time of year, actually, 99 bucks a night. We're going to stay downtown Chicago. We're going to see the sights. So this tradition, tradition we started, what, five, six, six years ago, seven? I don't know, maybe longer. The first time we did it, we had to leave early to beat the snowstorm out. <laughs> we had to stay halfway up there. It was, remember that? It was crazy. But, so, but we did that because they were so focused on their friends that getting away and alone, we got quality time together. So now we do that with their spouses, all of us. We go, we get a couple rooms, and the guys in one room, girls in another. If you want to sleep with your spouse, pay for your own room, but I'll pay for two rooms. And, uh, and we just camp out together and spend the weekend together. It's awesome. But, you know, other traditions like that to create and meet that need that, that needs to be met to get that quality time. Um, so we're running out of time, but um, create family traditions. Um, my wife's always great about that. She created this new family tradition about every year you bring an ornament to hang on the tree. That was something about that happened that year, and you share about it with each other. So each couple comes and they bring an ornament to the Christmas dinner, and we share about what, what happened in their life that year that's memorable. Uh, make birthday special. Uh, our oldest son's birthday is this coming Thursday. Every birthday we have, we have a special dinner. They get to pick what and where, and we sit together, and we have a great meal, and then we share things that we appreciate about them. And we all go around, we all share. Now this is all eight of us doing this now as opposed to the five that it used to be. And the two that can't be there that are in Atlanta, they've already scheduled it in. They're going to Skype in. We'll set up the, the uh, iPad there. and It'll be Skype. They'll be part of the whole meeting, and we'll do it together. We continue to make it happen even when we don't all live together. Uh, plan vacations together. This summer, before uh, these married kids start having kids, we're going to get away and, and do a cruise together. The cruises are going to cruise, and we're looking forward to that. Um, um, we have this family text that we do, and I just titled it La Familia, and, and everybody's on it. And so randomly, dif different topics, different days, we'll just text everybody. instead. Of, you know how sometimes you want to text something to one person? We keep trying to keep everybody in it so everybody is, whether they live in Atlanta or whether they live here, Everybody's informed what we're talking about, even the minuscule dumb things that we talk about sometimes. And I make jokes that make no sense and aren't funny, but <laughs> that's dad. That's what dads do. Make memories and talk about them. Pictures everywhere, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, do, do a lot of things. Scheme. Figure out what works for your family. It's not the same. And all your kids are different. You've got to figure out what works for them. One time, Tyler was really in a bad place, and I couldn't get through to him. And this is before this was even popular. And... Uh, I took him out shooting. <laughs> we went to a gun range and shot guns. I thought, well, maybe that'll like do something. It's not like, like you said, it's not, it's not cool to be with your dad, but we'll go do something that, that I've never done before. <laughs> um, expect all your family members to be at all family events. I think it's an expectation you've got to create. My mom and dad shared this. We have a family reunion. The whole, they're, all their kids and their siblings and kids, we have it once a year, and everybody does everything possible to get there. We schedule around it. We make sacrifices. The kids have all been part of this for years. It's, it's an amazing time, but you've got to have everybody committed to being at all the family events. You've got to keep stressing that. You've got to make sacrifices. Encourage them to make sacrifices to make it happen. In closing, in conclusion, to build unity in the family, we need to lead it like a good shepherd, laying down your life for the sheep, and they will follow.
It's that spirit, that heart of God, that I will do whatever it takes to win them over, uh, no matter how far they are, no matter where they're at. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to figure out ways. I'm going to scheme and together in our marriage be unified. Show them respect no matter what. There's reasons to respect and show them respect. Make them feel that and keep scheming for ways to be together. So that's it. Thanks, guys, for all your contributions. Yeah.